Welcome everybody to the Yulestack Natural Area. We're here today with the lovely Janae, who is a volunteer from the Yulestack Natural Area Habitat. <laughs> I was trying to remember what UNIREP stands for. UNIREP, I know. UNIREP. The Yulestack Natural Area Education and Restoration Project. Yes. These people are amazing. And so uh, I asked Janae if she would give us a little tour and share her love of this location through her own personal passions and experience. So here we go, everybody. Here's Janae. Hi. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Uli Stack. And um, it's a nice day. We've got some sun out. Uh, the creatures are moving about, the birds. And we're going to talk about what's going on at Uli Stack in the fall. I'm sure a lot of you have been here, visited, or you know of somebody who has, and you know what a lovely place it is, and, and how calming it is, and how wonderful it is to, to, to walk off the street and into Uli Stack and, and enjoy nature. So we'll talk a little bit about the plants, and how do they behave in the fall, what's blooming. We'll talk a little bit about monarchs. We have a, a large area of milkweed or we've got milkweed growing all around the native california milkweed so we'll talk about that and um, if you have questions along the way please feel free to ask me i'll do my best to answer i my husband and i have been volunteering here since 2016 and um so we're kind of newbies even though you know we're, we're learning every day we're still in college learning uh, right here in this beautiful habitat. So we we volunteer when, uh, well, because of COVID, we're not we're not having the volunteering right now. Um, that'll probably come back, I'm guessing, in 2021. But in the meantime, there's a few of us who can come and uh, just do a few a few things to keep to keep Uli Stack, you know, running. So we'll talk a little bit. We'll start talking about the plants, and the one behind me is where we'll start. This is Saint Catherine's lace. Now this, you can see this beautiful plant here is basically, this is what it looks like when it's blooming. It, it's all cream colored here. You see this, this, uh, this color here. And as it starts to change and go to sleep, um, the color turns to this beautiful rust. And I just think it's a lovely visual thing to see when you come here. Sometimes we think about fall and a lot of the California native plants, you know, they go to sleep. Their, their leaves fall, they turn brown. That's how they protect themselves because it's California's kind of like a desert. So this is one of the plants and, uh, you know, that changes and, and shows us the beautiful change of color. And uh, right behind it is a coyote bush, very uh, commonly seen in California. And this particular plant is really important because it blooms in the fall. You see these little these little cream blooms here and uh, it's kind of like a pollinator plant. It provides nectar for bees and whatever bees and butterflies are still out this time of year. So let's follow along and see what else we can find that's blooming at um, Uli Stack. And we'll talk about some of the native California plants. This is a, the uh, white sage. It's, it's more common down in Southern California, um, I, you know, and I don't, if some of the things I say may be wrong. So if, if you, if I do say something and it's obviously not correct, be sure to, you know, put something in there and talk about it because I'm, I'm still learning. Um, it's a beautiful sage. It's very aromatic. It was used by the native, they still use it as smudge sticks. I do believe they also used it to cook with. Drop off. Oh, there we go. Okay. There we go. We're back. Uh, so white sage it's a lovely lovely plant to to uh, get these long blooms in the spring this is you can see how they're finishing up here and we'll head this way and check out some more plants see this one this is deer grass right yeah. this is a native california grass and um, some more st catherine's lace how do we do this should we step over the thing when we get over there let's go to the toyon berries here one of the plants that produce a lot of food for fall um, migrating birds, especially the um, cedar waxwings and robins. They come in this time of year and many other birds feast on these toyon berries. 
uh, this is the, let's see now, this is the holly berry or Christmas berry. Christmas yeah, so if, I, if my story is correct, I believe this is the same plant that grew all over the Hollywood Hills. And when they, you know, in the early days, when they found it there, I guess they thought it was kind of like a holly berry, a Christmas berry. And I believe that's where the word Hollywood comes from. Is that, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I so that so, big yeah. that big sign that says Hollywood, where'd that come from? Well, it has to do with the toyon, and, uh, or the holly berry, or the Christmas berry. These little berries are, they, were, they are edible, but they're really, they're very pithy, and they, are, they have to be prepared properly. They've, they've got some something in them. I forget, and I read about it. Now I forget. Astringents. Astringents, that's it. So they're a little bit kind of not so good tasting. I think you mentioned, <laughs> Terry mentioned that they can be, um, you said like heated. Um, oh, braised. Braised, yeah. Yes, and they I've can also, be braised. I've also read you can heat them up and cook them. They make jams out of them. So, um, but they're, they're basically, you know, you have to know how to, I don't know how to cook them. So, but anyways, lovely plant, and all around Uli Stack, you'll probably notice, you know, um, the Toyon berries this time of year. So pretty soon, keep watching Uli Stack Facebook, and pretty soon you'll see the, the uh, Erica will post pictures about the, the cedar wax wings coming in, and they come in in, in large groups, and uh, you can see them here at Uli Stack. We'll head this way, and we're going to look at some more flowering plants that flower in the fall here. Um, right here is, it, it doesn't look like much, they almost look like they're kind of burned, but this is the California aster. This is a, a fall plant that blooms and creates, it provides nectar for whatever insects are still out, native bees. Um, you may see some butterflies. I haven't seen a lot. Have you, have you seen many? I haven't seen a lot this time of year, butterflies. The little skipper, that little, that little orange one with the big brown eyes, that little teeny one. Um, you'll see them this time of year, but you'll, some, there's still some native bees out. These provide nectar, and those are some of the things that are needed by, um, by, by creatures that visit Ulistak. The, another one that provides a lot of nectar is the fuchsia. This is the California fuchsia. This is a butterfly, I mean a um, hummingbird magnet. They, lo they love this. So when you walk through Uli Stack, you may have seen the hummingbirds around the fuchsia this time of year. Um, it's a really vibrant plant and it's, it's a beautiful, hardy California native. For those of you who have an area in your yard. A fuchsia is a great California native plant to to create your California native garden. So um, it does does kind of take you know spread out and take over. So you need some space for it. Um, oh, in fact, if you look over here, you'll see how it's it just it's just a beautiful plant this time of year. Just that orangey red, just kind of popping out, and it has that little tube shaped flower, which is perfect for a little hummingbird. Um, let's see, so from here, why don't we head back, we're going to head over towards the creek, and as we walk through, we'll look for what plants are doing. Um, if you look down this way on the ground, you'll see some, we have a lot of sage here, and I have to tell you, I am sage challenged. There are so many varieties. Um, it seems you can always tell by the aroma, you know, they have that sagey smell, but I'm still kind of challenged as, as to what kind of sage. There's black sage, and there's Cleveland sage, and there's white sage, and so on. So I'm not sure what kind, but you can see how it looks, almost looks dead, but it's not. It's asleep. It's just kind of hiding out, resting until the, the rains start, and then all of these will just come to life. So be sure that you're going to visit, be sure and visit in the spring because that is when Uli Stack and all the native plants really show off how beautiful they are. So as we walk through the butterfly garden, this is, oh, this area here, that's what I want to talk about. This area in here, which is pretty dense, is one of the first areas that was planted by volunteers uh, when they started this project back in 1999, I believe. And all of this work here that, was, that has been done up until today 
has been done by volunteers, thousands and thousands of hours of volunteers. And the people that, st that started this project, um, I was, it was Chris and Jean Salander, uh, I hope I said their name properly, and then um, Dennis, Dowling. Dennis Dowling and Karen uh, Campbell joined them. She's here with you today. She says, hi, nice to see you. Karen! Nice to see you back again. Yes, Karen? Mm -hmm. Yay! Hi, Karen. I wanted to, to make sure and point out that, that the early pioneers of Uli Stack did a lot of work with the city and with the, um, with the water. or habitat. Let's see, do we want to go around this way? Let's go through this way. One of the things that, um, that I enjoy about this area is that in the springtime, this all these plants start to bloom and you get these little areas where you'll have the purple ceanothus blooming and the yellow uh, flannel bush and it's just like a little haven in here so be sure and visit in the spring things start to come to life and bloom here as early as February the manzanitas um, they start to bloom and then the ceanothus and the currants the yellow current and the pink currants and we really look forward to seeing all of those as they come to life. So this area through here, again, is the butterfly garden. It was established, or be, it was started in, in the early 2000s. And so this area is what you would call an established California native habitat. All of these plants are native California plants. And they've been growing like this for at least 18 years. And this is what we were trying to accomplish in a big portion of this, this area. Uh, Uli Stack is 40 acres and um, there's a lot more work to do. Uh, when we walk through, I'll show you areas where we're just beginning to, to plant and how eventually we want it to look like this. So as she, as she pans, as Terry pans the camera around, you can see just how big and lush and grown in these native plants are. Does anybody have any about Uli Stack? Maybe about um, uh, the kind of work that we do or how it's maintained or any of the plants that you see? Um, questions about their growth? We do have one question. Um, somebody's asking what type of, he wonders what type of wildlife you might see here. That's a really good question. And I would say the, the first thing that pops in my head is birds. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that this habitat draws in is birds. So we see raptors, um, we see um, owls, woodpeckers, um, I'm still, I'm kind of bird challenged, like I said. So we see all kinds of native California birds. We see birds that, that fly in and visit uh, because they're migrating. 
And if you go to Uli Stack Facebook, you will just fall in love with all the information that Erica has. She's our, our volunteer photographer here. She's an amateur photographer and she provides a ton of information daily and weekly about the birds that are visiting. And you can go back quite a ways and see, you know, just, just what's going on day by day, week by week. So visit Uli Stack Facebook. Um, what other birds are here? There's the, the towhees are here most of the time. We have a, a family now of the uh, thrashers. That's the one with the kind of the long beak. They run along the ground and thrash their beak in looking for bugs. Um, we have, of course, there's always, I want to call them magpies, the um, mockingbirds, the ones that end up picking up songs from many other birds and then creating this big, long musical chorus of, of songs that they've copied from other birds. And it's, it's beautiful, beautiful to hear them. So we'll head this way, we'll go past the creek and we'll visit um, a milkweed patch. And the milkweed patch, is it all right if I walk and talk? Oh, yeah, yeah. So this milkweed patch that we're going to look at, here's one right here. It's quite a bit of, let me stop for a second. It's quite a bit of milkweed now that's growing all around the, this habitat because it was planted years ago and it's, you know, it's starting to spread. Here's one here. You can see the seeds have, the pods have, you know, opened up. And these are the little seeds. They, they have like this little, you've probably seen them before, but they almost have like a little, uh, what would you call that? This fuzzy <laughs> helicopter thing. And when you when they get caught in the wind, they they it's amazing how far they'll float. And so milkweed, the native California milkweed, which is called narrow leaf milkweed, is growing all around Uli Stack. It it grows really well. It's easy to grow. If you want to start milkweed, narrow leaf milkweed is I can never say the Latin name. Asclepius folliculares. I don't know why, but my mouth doesn't <laughs> want to say it. Anyways, narrow leaf milkweed is, is the easiest milkweed to, native milkweed to grow, and it grows the easiest. So, if you... We do have a question oh, about ahead. whether or not you use master gardeners to help restoring the natives. That's a good do you question. Team up with them? Good question. Yeah. You know what? I went back and I was reading some of the emails that Dennis had sent us about the history of Uli Stack. And it I don't know for sure, but it seems like there was some information Karen might know too. She's on there. There was some information about some some biologists. Is that the right term that they used and have consulted with to talk about um, where to put you know Oh, the botanist. That's what I was botanist, yeah, right. Yeah. Botanist, that's what I'm thinking. Um, I don't know. That'd be a good one for Karen. Maybe she could pop in and type in a little information there. But I, I'm not sure exactly, but I think they, whenever they can, they consult with, you know, with people who can help. Because it's all volunteer, you know, sometimes it's harder to get that kind of, of support. Um, people are busy and so on. All right, so this is a man-made creek that was put in several years ago here. The water is, uh, um, it's uh, recycled water from Sunnyvale, or the Valley Water, Valley Water, what is it? Yeah. Anyways, it runs down through this creek, and there's a little, we call it a pond, but it's just kind of a glorified ditch, and it just runs long enough to just create some water here and then dry, and then we run it in every few days. And it makes a nice, it draws the, the birds in. So it creates a nice little area here. Oh, Hi, how you doing? Good, good, I'm reading your shots. No, it's all right. We have visitors here. There's always people visiting. We're gonna oh, head. What a beautiful place this is. I know, it is. Absolutely. Are you enjoying your walk? Oh, yeah. Totally. Totally. Right here. Very good, enjoy. There's a lot of um, oak trees that were planted here. I'm kind of tree challenged. I seem to have my focus down plants. However, I have noticed that when you volunteer here and you work with native California plants, um, your focus kind of tends to go up eventually because the plants bring in insects and birds and then the birds live up in the trees. So start somewhere. Some people start up and look at the birds and know the trees and then they come down to the plants. Some people start with plants and work their way up 
and some people start in the middle. So there's, you know, there's no rule as to how you start. Are I making any sense? There we go, now we go. Yes. You're doing great. Good. So if you have any um, uh, inclination to come here and work or be a part of Uli Stack's uh, continual habitat restoration, there's, we, we start where we're um, interested and all of us are like in college. We're all learning. Uh, I've really just gotten into native California habitats since 2016 and I, I knew about natives, I knew about plants, parts of plants, but I really didn't get the whole concept of native habitat. Somehow it just finally came together. So this is a great place to learn and it's a great place to start. And again, you may start up or you may start down or somewhere in the middle. But we're all being trained and taught, so there's something to learn. So, and my point here with this is there's a lot of oaks here, a lot of oaks, live oaks and valley oaks. And uh, I don't think there's any, is there any black oaks here. And they're loaded with, with, um, what are those called? Acorns. <laughs> and of course, acorns are eaten by squirrels, ground squirrels, um, birds, and little insects bore holes into them and eat them. So there's all kinds of little creatures that... Are we in a... Is this a bad spot, there we think? Go, there we go. Back up again? It's just having trouble with the Wi-Fi today. Yeah. Keeping hold of the hot spot. Thank you for being patient with us. Um, technical difficulties, please... Please hold, uh, but we'll be back. We're still here, so stay with us if you can. We're gonna, there's Kurt, hi. Water. This is Kurt, yeah, this is my husband, Kurt. We work together here at Uli Stack. He brought me water, very good, thanks. Thanks, Kurt. We're gonna head over to the little butterfly, the little uh, milkweed patch. Oh, again, along here is a little creek on this side. You can see it running there. It's a man-made creek. It was created by, you know, by the city, and it really provides a lot of beauty and um, it, cre it brings the birds over. The squirrels come over here too. Sometimes we'll see them scurrying away. There's a lot of information to talk about Uli Stack and how it works. You know, the connection between uh, the city of Santa Clara, the water company, and all of the different ways that they work together and the the um, open space authority so if anybody has any questions about that um, feel free we're going to look over here at a, a milkweed patch this milkweed patch was planted a year ago right karen over a year by the girl sprouts which is an an organi <laughs> right organization of um young girls who came i think they if i understand the story correctly they got a hold of Karen because they wanted to have a, a, a project over here. And Karen and said they wanted to grow milkweed and took this spot and they coordinated it. And then they got the seeds and they grew milkweed in these little plastic containers. It was so sweet. And um, then Karen had it organized. They came over and then they planted this area here with milkweed. And we put in a few other pollinators because there's there's a couple of things you need in, in a uh, pollinator garden or, or a butterfly garden. You need the, the native milkweed, which is the host plant for the monarch, and then you need nectar. So they're, they're all kind of asleep now, so it's hard to see them, but there are some other uh, nectar providing flowers that bloom in here in the summer. But anyways, this is the narrow leaf. This is one of our newer patches. It's doing really well, however, um, we have, was that a, I hope we can see some monarchs today, but unfortunately we haven't seen any, very many so far this fall. Um, normally there would be, you know, caterpillars on here, you know, those big, fat, thick caterpillars that are yellow and white and black. You've probably seen them, but we haven't seen any so far this year. The monarch population is tanking. It's, it's really gone down tremendously. M millions, it, from millions in the 1990s to just a few thousand now. So Uli Stack works hard to plant the um, native milkweed all around to provide uh, food for caterpillars. And this is where the female monarchs would lay eggs on these. And so uh, one of the projects is my husband and I have been 
enjoying and working with Uli Sack and uh, that is planting more native California milkweed. So we grow some at home too in the spring and uh, we were going to plant a whole bunch this spring and we had all of our pots ready and as you all know we were all hit with a pandemic and everything got turned upside down. So we have quite a few pots at home. The city has asked us to not do any volunteer work here because of COVID. They want everybody to stay safe, which by the way, I don't have my mask on, but Terry is more than six feet away. I just want you to know that because we're, we're really um, following the, the rules and regulations that have been set by the city because we respect life and that's what it's about in this difficult time. It's about respecting life. And that's what we do when we come out here and work with natives. And so that brings us to your personal passion and love, which is butterflies. And in a time like this, when it's so difficult, that's one location where you find beauty. Right? It is, thank you, it is. And so Kurt and I have been working with I call it assisting monarchs. We actually have a tiny monarch habitat in our backyard. Just we only live two miles away. Oh, we are people, <laughs> and so um, that's kind of how we got started here. We we were growing. We saw a movie at the IMAX theater, and it was about the monarchs. How they had you know figured flight of the monarch, flight of the butterfly. Or maybe you guys saw it. it was like 2012, and we just were just blown away at this this incredible. Uh, little insect and what it does and so we went home and we grew some some uh, tropical milkweed and I think I had one butterfly come in lay an egg and or it came in late eggs but we had one go full term all the way to emerging and we were so excited well then we learned that that really isn't a native plant and it wasn't the right it, it's not healthy it actually can cause problems for the monarch and you want to grow native plants. And then a neighbor said, well, they grow native milkweed over at Uli Stack. And I said, Uli what? And that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's how it started. And they said, well, why don't you go over there and check it out? And the day that we came, we're, they were finishing up a, a work session and, and Karen graciously took us on a, at least a 45 minute tour and we were hooked. We were so excited. And at that time, that was 20, I think, I'm thinking fall of 2015, there were quite a few caterpillars all around. And in just that short of time from then till now, the population has gone down so much that we, we don't even see any here. So it's kind of urgent that we all take the time to, if you can, grow some native milkweed. We can talk about that a little more. So this patch is doing really well. Last year, we actually had quite a few monarchs and we had eggs and we had um, the, the caterpillars will go as far as 10 feet away to crawl up onto a bush that is not the milkweed. They'll go crawl up on the bush and then become a chrysalis. They do that to protect themselves and, and get away from their the host plant and hide. You can't see them very well. I mean, it's, it's quite a bit to search through and find a chrysalis. They just blend in. Those, those little green, you've seen them maybe, the green chrysalis. So um, Kurt and I grow quite a bit of it at home and then we also assist them by what we do is they, they, the monarchs come into our yard and they lay eggs on the potted milkweed. And then we take that potted milkweed and we once we find eggs all over them, we put all those pots into a nursery. It's like a mesh nursery. It's about, you know, it's big. It's got a big zipper and you put everything in and we let all those go full term all the way through a chrysalis. And then when, when, when they emerge, we, um, we release them. Uh, sometimes we'll bring a few over here and release them at Uli Stack because it's, it's interesting for people to see. And hey, how you doing? Yes, very good, thank you. <laughs> All right, um, it, it, this is a public place. So we have folks asking what the address for this is so they can come here. And yes, this is a public park and it is open to the public. And it is also mostly wheelchair accessible. So if you'd like to come and take a ride around, you can do that too. But if anybody who's online right now um, can research the address for us or uh, link to a pin drop to come out here and then post that in the comments, that would be great. 
Yes. Ooh, that would help. I can't think of the address. Can you think of it? I know that you can, you, you can go here to ulistack.org. So you want to go to this site right here. It's really hard to remember it. So to go to ulistack.org, it'll show that there's a map. It'll talk to you about volunteering. And also you can sign up for the newsletter so that you can stay in touch. And there's no advertisements. It's all free of advertisements. It's just information about Uli Stack. There's a nice letter every month now done by John, our, our bee scientist. And he, um, he'll include information about uh, what's going on. And there are other contributors who write articles in the newsletter. And it's, it's not very long. And there's nice pictures, too, about who's, what uh, creatures are here, what birds are visiting. So. Um, because everything that was done by volunteers here, and because we always need more volunteers, and we're so grateful for volunteers, we want to encourage you to volunteer, sign up for the newsletter at ulistack.org. And there you'll find information to answer your question also about the, um, the address. Let's see, where else? Pictures of your monarchs there? Um, yes, do yeah. people, should we show it? I brought this, all right, let's take a look here. Oh, let me find one. I brought this along just to, you remember the caterpillar, right? Do you remember that big? It's so dis, it's, it's so specific looking. And then the monarchs, of course. All right, hang on. I brought this just in case we had any questions. How come I can't find? All right. There we go. Sorry, right, right there, the first one. Here's a sideways view of the monarch. Do you, do you remember this one? Um, so monarchs need milkweed and they have several stages that they go through. It takes about 30 days from the time the egg is laid. I don't know if this is going to, I don't know if you can see this. From the time the egg is laid until they emerge as a butterfly. It's about a 30 day process. And each stage is uh, some, something particular they need. They lay eggs on the milkweed, then, they, then the caterpillar eats the milkweed, and then the caterpillar becomes a chrysalis, not a cocoon. A cocoon is, a, is silk, and this is not silk. It's, a, it's actually a little, well, kind of like plastic Different. almost, yeah. So it's a, a chrysalis, and then the chrysalis, of course, turns to a butterfly, or emerges as a butterfly. And this whole process takes about 30 days, and they need milkweed. Every moth and butterfly that you've ever seen in your life has a specific plant that it needs called a host plant that it lays the eggs on and that the caterpillars will eat. Some moths and, and um, butterflies have several host plants like the swallowtail can, that's the yellow one you know with the yellow and black stripes. It has several host plants and so does the, um, the painted lady they'll have more than one host plant. But the monarch is very specific, and it needs milkweed. It, and in California, it needs native California milkweed. There's more than one native California milkweed. However, the one that grows the easiest here for now, we'll start with, is the narrow leaf milkweed. So that's a little bit of information on the monarchs. Is that uh, this one right here? Yeah, so that's the narrow leaf milkweed. And many of you may know that you may know that um, that the monarchs go down to Mexico. How many of you have seen articles or um, movies or documentaries about the monarchs that fly all the way down to these special forests in Mexico, thousands of miles, and then they stay there all winter? Well, we also have monarchs that stay on the, on the west coast. So the eastern monarchs that head up that way, they go down to Mexico. And the western monarchs, this is a map that kind of gives you an idea of what, what happens. So there's the special area in Mexico where the monarchs will go and stay. And, and when they start out in the spring, they head over to the eastern part of the United States. They'll go all the way up to Canada. Here in our in the western United States, we have monarchs that go to the west coast. You can see that orange line. So 
Some do go to Mexico, but most of them stay right along our California coast. And maybe some of you have gone and seen them at Natural Bridges or Pacific Grove. Uh, there's some small areas where the monarchs stay all winter. And so a lot of people don't realize that there's actually the eastern and the western monarch population. The western monarch population has taken a great hit and has really declined in the last few years. So that's why it's, this is a great opportunity at Uli Stack to plant native plants that need to be here and also include the milkweed. Five more minutes. Whoa! Okay. Um, I don't know what you want to head over. Yeah, there could be a part two next time. Part two. I wanted to let you. I know. I want to again say all of the work done here from the beginning, from the very beginning, all the interaction with the city, um, all of the volunteers that come during the week. There's a lot of companies, Silicon Valley companies that send out volunteers during the week, and uh, there'll be sometimes up to 20 people. And Dennis and Karen did. Uh, tremendous amount of work year after year after year working with all those volunteers and all the work they did. Uli Stack has a lot of pictures. I mean, uh, Uli Stack Facebook has a lot of pictures of, of that information so you can see who's been here. If you just kind of go back a few years, just, um, you know, run through. So we want to mention again how important all the early pioneers were in establishing this place and how important it will be to continue to have volunteers. Um, it's a great way to meet people. It's a wonderful way to decompress. Um, this month is Mental Health Awareness Month. And I don't think there's anything, well, I don't know how to say this. Nature is one of the main ways to help with mental health. It, it's not the only way. There are, mental health, as we know, is a very complex subject. And we all need to take care of ourselves and to be aware of how important mental health is. Nature can really add to decompressing and helping us to feel grounded and remember to take a breath, take a deep breath, and maybe put the phone in the pocket for a minute and listen to some of the birds or just sit still and see what's going on around you, what little bugs are flying around and what plants are going to sleep or which ones are waking up. So this is a great place to do that and it's important for all of us. Um, again, think about volunteering. Go to ulistack.org and sign up for the newsletter. We all look forward to seeing you out here and we're all learning. And I'm sure there's several things I said today that may not have completely been correct because like I said, we're all in this learning phase. So come and join us. Uh, come and learn with us. Come help us and, and walk into nature, which, which is the great neutralizer. So we'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Remember that you can always come out to the Ulistak Natural Area. It's over in Santa Clara. And this group is really wonderful to work with. Everybody's welcome here. So. Uh, if you want more information, you can look on the Open Space Authority webpage at www.openspaceauthority.org. And you can also look at ulastack.org and come check things out. We'd love to see you and we will plan on doing a part two. Thank oh, you for yeah. joining we've us we've today. We've got to do a springtime. <laughs> bye thank bye, you, everybody. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.